Historia Canadiana is recorded on the unceded lands of the Kanyan Kaheka First Nation. Hello everyone and welcome to Historia Canadiana, the show where we talk about Canadian literature and history and, you know, sometimes go on tangents and stuff because we just be like that sometimes. It it do be like that. (laughs) My name is Patrick and with me is the Barracuda from Bermuda, Mackenzie. (laughs) hi how's it going that was the best rhyme i could find with bermuda i don't know what else (laughs) barracuda god so before we get started on today's episode uh, don't forget that you can rate the show subscribe do all that wonderful stuff tell your friends about it we've been we've been getting more and more reviews they've been good thank you very much to all the people who have been doing that on spotify and apple giving us four or five star reviews beautiful people even the people who give us one star reviews because then we learn it's a learning experience everybody but honestly why would you give us one star just 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 lie stroke our egos a bit (laughs) yeah stroke my ego today oh yeah also thank you for our lovely patrons um they help make this show possible and it's great we're uh constantly uh you know producing extra content over on patreon so if you want to join our patron hall of fame over there you can do so for like three dollars a month uh and yeah consider it it helps and that's pretty much it we haven't mm-hmm. actually sat down and recorded an episode together in like a month no we did a pop yeah. down episode but we haven't so if you want to hear us back together again Check us out on Bop on Pop Canada or Bop Canada. It is indeed a Bop. Bop. It's a Bop. James Cameron was fun to talk about. He was <laughs> absolutely. But we've been doing interviews. Uh, well, I've been doing interviews, and so I've been a working the, man. Yeah, and so if you want to actually get those interviews early, they are already up on our Patreon, and I'll be releasing them progressively on our main feed. Anyway. Um, today we're going to be talking about a topic that at least people will have a passive knowledge of if they've turned on their news feed for like five seconds, right? because it's been everywhere. Um, so we're going to be talking specifically about Ukrainians and their relation to Canada and their immigration to Canada, because as I was telling Mac before the show, Canada has a surprisingly large Ukrainian population. We're one of the big, we have one of the biggest Ukrainian uh, population or Ukrainian yeah. descendant populations <clears throat> in the world. I think we were the That's third. Weird. Yeah, like why? Just just out of curiosity here, like why do you find it weird? Is it because you don't expect it as much? Like, yeah, I don't what? expect. It's just it's 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 probably true for a couple of different populations. It's just mm. that Ukrainian is so specific, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then it's also just the fact that they're so far removed from what you would expect. Yeah. And it's it's interesting because while at the time that they were immigrating, so specifically today, we're going to be talking about the first wave of Ukrainian Canadian immigrants. We're going to be doing so through a short story called The Stone Cross, which was written by Vasil Stefanik in 1899. So right around the time the first wave of Ukrainian immigration was really kicking off here in Canada. And uh, it's available for free. It's linked in the description. Um, But it is kind of interesting where at the time, Ukrainians were seen as very different from like mainstream Euro-Canadian population, if you will. Mm -hmm. But now they're very normalized, right? Like we don't even think about it anymore. They're just an average part of the Canadian population and, you know, most of the descendants of Ukrainian immigrants speak English or French and, you know, have just are actually part of the government, Mm -hmm. right? Um, What's her face? Um, She's part of Trudeau's cabinet. Um, Christia Freeland, I think, um, has Ukrainian heritage and her grandfather, I think, was one of the people who came over, uh, but during a later wave, obviously, during the wave... uh, that was coming in during the Soviet Union era. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so obviously over, you know, this is, this is about 150 years of immigration. And so obviously a lot of these people would have had time to kind of adapt and surprisingly would have, uh, did bring a lot of, um, a lot of cultural things, which relates to our show, did bring a lot of cultural cachet, if you will, that integrated into like mainstream Canadian culture, particularly where it relates to folk music. A lot of Ukrainian music would have uh, actually influenced, especially in the West, uh, how Canadian music played out Mm -hmm. and like the use of instruments, the musical styles and so on. So 
Which do you feel like starting with today, actually? Do you feel like starting with the history or with the short story? Oh, hmm. History or the short story? Ooh. Let's go a little bit of the history first, just because otherwise the short story can be a little, like, strange. Okay, no problem. So we're going to jump ahead a little bit in our conventional history because we've been going in a relative chronological order. Mm -hmm. And at this point in our history, we are firmly, we're at the beginning of the Wilfrid Laurier government, right? So we've kind of skipped a few prime ministers between the last episodes that we've done, um, which were still either under MacDonald or Mackenzie. And we've kind of skipped forward in time a little bit to 1896, um, where under the Wilfrid Laurier government, a new man is uh, put into the position of Minister of Interior and Superintendent General of Indian Affairs, right? Do you know what the Minister of Interior does, by the way? Um, well, so the Minister of Interior is going to be looking after sort of interior affairs, which means that they will be, God, <clears throat> because there's a, wait, give me a second, I'm putting my thoughts in order. Yes. <laughs> They, they no longer exist, by the way. Right. So I'm guessing that means that they used to handle things like immigration then, since we now have the Minister of Immigration. Yes. And also, um, they in, in, the, the position was abolished in like 1936, and it was replaced by Minister Responsible for Indian Affairs and Minister of Mines and Resources. So like these two positions kind of made Minister <clears throat> of Interior obsolete. So it's just my minister of the people. Kind of. Yeah, that's pretty much, I think, the, the most succinct way that we can put it, right? And by and large, the risk that at the time, they were responsible for land management, immigration, like you were saying, um, what was called at the time Indian affairs, and natural resources extraction, mm -hmm. right? It was created later in Canada's history in 1873, but it's intrinsically tied to the way that immigration was conducted in Canada. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, you know, Canada kind of had a problem in air quotes, so to speak, because they felt like they didn't have enough immigration. Um, I mean, which is still true today. Some people argue that, you know, we, we don't have enough immigration. Some people argue we have too much. It's, it's still an issue that we see today. But within the 19th century Canadian mind, the goal was to settle the West, right? Like the Americans were doing. Mm -hmm. And part of the idea of settling the West was obviously for profit reasons. You wanted to extract the land and, uh, and make sure that the resources were properly exploited. But also it was to stop the Americans from coming north into that land. And by settling it en masse, you would stop that. Right? Mm -hmm. But for the early part of Canada's history, that was a problem. We saw it in part with the CPR and so forth. And it's really only in the 1890s, in the period that we're talking about now, that this is going to start changing under this new Minister of Interior, whose name was Clifford Sifton. Have you ever heard of this particular person? No, I have not. Okay. Sifton is kind of well known for, or at least in Canadian history, as being the person who really kicked immigration to Canada into high gear, right? Um, specifically under his leadership, immigration to Canada and specifically to the prairies increased from about six, um, let's say a little bit less than 17,000 per year in 1896 to 141,000 people a year in 1905. Oh, like damn. in the ten, nine years that he was there, or at least in the, those nine years, it mm -hmm. almost went up by 10 times, right? The number of people that we, in, uh, that we brought into the, uh, into the country. Um, and part of that was because Sifton, while, you know, uh, being a racist, because at the time everyone was, was also slightly more progressive than most insofar as he wasn't hung up on only bringing in British immigration, right? Mm -hmm. um, or French immigration to Quebec. And so by already changing that mentality and saying, no, you don't just have to have British people, right? But he still wanted white and Christian people, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. But not just British people, suddenly you open up a whole new, uh, a whole new ser uh, population that you can bring to Canada. And that's where Eastern Europe comes in, right? And that's really where a lot of the Eastern European populations that we see here really start to arrive in larger numbers. Germans, um, you know, <laughs> Austrians, and uh, Jews, and Ukrainians. And Actually, you would know. You would actually find this interesting. Sifton was responsible for government policy in the Yukon during the gold rush, right? That began in 1897. 
So he was the minister at the time who would have kind of helped bring the people towards the Yukon or encouraged people to go towards the Yukon and settle there as part of the gold rush. Mm -hmm. So that's probably where you would have heard his name, if ever, because you're more familiar with the gold rush. Gotta love the gold rush. (laughs) Yeah. And if ever you look at... um, if ever you look at posters, like if you look up like 1890s uh, Canadian immigration posters, you'll actually see what they were trying to, to to portray as an image. I don't know if you're looking it up on Google right now. Sure. So we'll just look at a few here, but on uh, just, just looking on Google and anyone can do this, I find it kind of interesting to see how Canada was portrayed at this time under oh, I remember the Sifton administration. I've seen these before. Yeah, for sure. They've become really iconic. Mm-hmm. Um, the golden field stretching out. <clears throat> mm-hmm. uh, my favorite is the one that has the river that divides the u.s from canada yeah and then the yep. sky like the clouds in the sky in the background are making the u.s flag but and then we've got the british flag yeah and they say very clearly forty thousand men needed in western canada to harvest bushels of grain mm-hmm. right you know yeah, and, 100 million bushels of grain yeah absolutely and you know they part of this and you see these you great swaths of uh, you know, build your west and uh, build your nest in Western Canada. I really like that one. <laughs> um, and of course, uh, a nice white farmer with a bushel of grain in one hand and a baby with a carrot pointing towards the future in another. It's very propagandistic, and mm-hmm. it's they, they, it was it worked right because, as we were saying, by 1905 there were 140,000 people coming to Canada. Um, so. I'll, uh, I just wanted to, to to show this in this case because it, it does show just how much um, pressure or how much of a project this was. It wasn't just, oh, we'll passively do this. No, it was a genuine like project and right. propaganda effort to bring as many people as possible to the West, right? Um, but obviously nothing comes like perfectly. Um, and... The um, a lot of English speaking Canadians were concerned that immigrants from Eastern and Central Europe would be a threat <clears throat> to their mm-hmm. culture because, as you we were saying before recording, they're white, they're Christian, but good God, they can't speak English, and that's terrible. So mm. immediately we have to reject them. Plus, they have these weird politics that we're going God. to be afraid of like 10 years from now that uh starts with a c and yeah it's weird it involves hammers and sickles and (laughs) and means of production seizing we laugh but we this this is foreshadowing for later episodes Mm -hmm. in which we will actually talk about them because the ukrainians and other like eastern europeans were very much involved in these new movements in canada i'm sure um and you know to, to to sifton's credit in a sense despite yeah being uh you know disparaging towards for example indigenous populations that he didn't care about you know moving in order to make space for these newly arrived immigrants um did defend what he called the quote unquote stalwart peasants in sheepskin coats right mm. that he was bringing in so he wasn't exactly super flattering towards them by calling them stalwart peasants in sheepskin coats but at least <laughs> He did defend them by saying that they were turning, that they were actually doing the jobs that, you know, British Canadians or Anglo Canadians weren't, Mm -hmm. right? And that is turning some of the most difficult areas of Canada into productive farms, which obviously is an issue now in terms of environment of like monoculture and so on. But that was the plan of Canada at the time. And, you know, in so far as that was their plan, it succeeded, right? And they allowed the, the, Eastern European uh, immigration allowed that to happen. Um, Plus there was like a weird racial element as well that he kind of justified the arrival of Ukrainian immigrants because he claimed that, well, because they were people who were used to cool (coughs) climates, they would naturally and genetically be better suited for farming the Western Canadian land because the Western... They, they already came from colder climates, and so naturally they must be genetically suited to do this. God, just saying yeah. it, just saying it makes me hurt. <laughs> it's so gross. It's, it goes to show that it doesn't matter how much you try and make yourself look, talk, and act like a duck, people will still find ways to, like, assert why their duck is better. Yep. Absolutely. It just goes to show how like a lot of, in case it wasn't painfully obvious about how a lot of racial categories and cultural categories are just completely made up. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, so it's just like, well, no, we're drawing this arbitrary line here. We're going to draw another arbitrary line. Yep. Speaking of arbitrary lines, though, the way they, um, in terms of the division of the land, is interesting because one of the ways that they also encouraged immigration was for offering land for <clears throat> next to nothing. I saw one source in particular say that the Canadian government offered 160 acres of land which is huge, yeah. uh, for about $10 at the time, right? Which even today is almost nothing. <laughs> like, almost like, nothing. It's, nothing, it's hard to I cre- tell you. It, it's hard to create an equivalency between then and now because the dollar is not the same, mm-hmm. is not calculated the same way, but it's it would be very affordable at the time to, to buy 160 acres for $10. And sometimes it was also given away for nothing. It was actually given away for free with... Uh, But you had to basically homestead on it, Mm -hmm. which means that you had, for people who don't know, you you had to actually produce X number of grain or sell your uh, your product for X amount of money and pay back the Canadian government within, say, five years or something Mm -hmm. like that. So homesteading, you get land for free, but you have to show that you actually did something quote unquote productive with it. You have to do stuff with the land. Yes, exactly. Um, Yeah. Obviously, anyone who was considered to be a non-agricultural immigrant, which is a weird statement, was discouraged. So Southern Europeans like Italians or Black people or even British urbanites. Well, yeah, you're also like you're turning away probably artisans. You're turning away like a lot of skilled laborers. Yep. Because that's not who we need. It's a very selective type of people that they're going for, and it's farmers. Right. We are farmers. Bum, 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 bum. Yeah. So, like, yes, there is a racial category to it. And, like, in for some reason, imagining that Black people can't farm, for example, or East Asians can't farm, which is weird. Or just anybody can't farm. Yeah. Like- I mean, obviously it is difficult work, but to assume that people can't learn is a bit weird. Yeah. But also it's just, it goes beyond racial categories and saying like, yeah, no, like even British urbanites are not welcome because that's not who we're looking for. We're not looking for unskilled labor. We're looking mm-hmm. for specific types of people. Their labor is too unskilled. Right. Peasantry. And as I kind of mentioned before we get specifically into Ukrainians and to answer your question as to why they would have been particularly... Um, um, like a particularly big part of immigration here to Canada. It is obvious that we need to mention at least indigenous populations and how they were kind of screwed over. Because <laughs> when aren't they? When aren't they at this point? But in this, during this era in particular, there's a specific moment that we need to talk about, and that's uh, because it happened specifically under Clifford Sifton. And as the head of de- the the Department of Indian Affairs, he cut costs left and right, which would obviously uh, be t- extremely detrimental to the resources that a lot of indigenous populations had access to. Mm-hmm. But also he approved in 1899 what was known as Treaty 8, which allowed the crown to secure about 850,000 square kilometers of land. Right. In one suit, that was just one treaty was 850,000 square kilometers uh, in what was then known as the Northwest Territories, British Columbia. <clears throat> and it allowed them, once the immigrants arrived in enough numbers, to create what is now northern Alberta, northwestern Saskatchewan, and parts of present day Northwest Territories in northern BC. Like mm-hmm. that, basically the middle part of Canada, right, is basically all Treaty 8, right? <laughs> And so obviously a lot of indigenous people were displaced and so on. And it set the groundwork for creating the modern provinces of Alberta and Saskatchewan in this case. Um, And it was also a primary motivation for securing safe passage for gold prospectors who were headed to the Yukon, right? Because now it's crown land. So you can send a bunch of settlers there, no problem, if they don't have to deal with, quote unquote, deal with indigenous populations. Mm -hmm. Anything you want to add so far before we talk specifically about Ukrainians and the literature? Um, I hope nobody is surprised by this at this point. Yeah, like... I hope no. nobody is shocked. Although, it, Clifford Sifton is a really mixed bag for me because, yes, he was, like a by today's standards, like morally a terrible person, but also by then standards, a bit better than most. So it's like, okay, I don't... I hate you, but not that much. I like, hate you less than everybody else. It was like when you were talking when when we were talking about James Cook. I remember something that you said. He was like he was better than most, but like if everyone was at like a ten percent good, he was maybe at like a fifteen percent. Yeah, 
<laughs> that's what we say in general about these things you know like <laughs> things are good but they could be better mm -hmm. exactly so it, not surprising but we do have to talk about him because he is fundamental to shaping modern canada mm -hmm. right like without him or at least without the actions that he did it wouldn't probably look the same uh, as it does today or at least not in the same time frame right so <clears throat> And I think another important part of what goes on with a guy like Clifford Sifton and the policies he enacted, I think it, mm -hmm. it sets the stage for a lot of how we still, how Canada still exists today. And the fact, again, no urbanites, yeah. no like people who are not farmers. Like this is directly, not it probably purposefully, but this is like almost a direct counter to something like the industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. You're not bringing industrialists into the country, you're bringing farmers, agriculturalists, people who are not going to live in the city. Yeah. Therefore, like you are setting up a plan that's going to continue for hundreds of years now of a non-urban country and population. Absolutely. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's fascinating to me because simultaneously what happens in Europe, right, of the displacement of a lot of farmhands, right, with the industrial revolution or the industrialization mm -hmm. that's happening in the 19th century, where a lot of farmers have to go towards the city and work in factories now because their jobs are kind of displaced by heavy machinery. Mm -hmm. At that same time, that same um, phenomenon allows canada to say okay well no we'll take these displaced farmers right and bring them here we'll give so them a purpose yeah exactly it's it is a fascinating kind of moment and obviously eventually we'll kind of go through the same <laughs> affair where a lot of farmers will just move to the cities anyway and we see the major urbanization of canada in many ways but right. um it, but it's always it's a bit different than the urbanization of the rest sure, of the world sure 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 because we <clears> still have like huge swaths of land that we can yeah exploit and expand upon well canada in general is just one large situation of like we're still like we're a first world country that still relies mostly on resource harvesting and production yeah absolutely right both for like mines and aren't we the biggest lentil producer in the world or something like that <laughs> So it surprise like, me if we were. No, I think it, I think we are or one of the biggest. Um, but like we're a, we're a major oil company. We're a major mm -hmm. like oil country. Sorry, <laughs> oil company. The country is a company. <laughs> exactly. At this point, really, who are we kidding? Timber. Timber <laughs> yeah. is still massive. Yeah. Timber harvesting and exploitation exploitation is still massive here. Mm -hmm. Like it's oh, it's it's so strange to me to think about Canada as a country and a concept that's so strange and almost contradictory yeah. to the rest of the world. Yeah. But also intrinsically tied to the way that the rest of the world kind of operates. Yeah. Right. Like you're going to be a leading economy. You're in the G7. You're going to be like a stable economic foundation of the world, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. It's like, so how are you going to do that? So by being what the others are not. We're going to harvest resources. <laughs> oh, you're going to like turn them into products within your country? No. <laughs> we'll let, <laughs> the fuck it? We'll let Asian people do that for us. We're going to do like, a massive exports. There you go. And then we're going to have like, it's going to be made elsewhere and then shipped back to us. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of country are we? You have oh, all this land. Are you going to have like people living everywhere? No. <laughs> Interferes with the resource exploitation. So that's the thing, right? Okay. So to bring it back to the episode though, when you were saying, are we going to have people everywhere? We say no now. At the time, the answer would have been yes, <coughs> right? That's mm -hmm. the goal. It's not to have like this very low population density that we have today. No, on the contrary, and this is under Wilfrid Laurier's government specifically, is that his idea, and by extension Sifton's, is to say that the 20th century, which is looming, obviously, in this at this bum, moment, bum, bum. is going to be Canada's century, yeah. and that we're going to reach 100 million people soon, which is not the case. That's not what happened. <laughs> but, but that was... We got a third of the way there. <laughs> obviously. Still today, 150 years later, <laughs> like 35 million. 38 million. million. 38, okay. It's, we have like we have less than fucking california right so it, it is fascinating to me that even when there are these um massive pushes to bring people in that are by the standards of the time successful we still haven't reached like the hundred million goal that we wanted at the time well it's also uh, just in relation to like other countries because like yeah we have our <clears throat> we have the idea that 
we are a big northern country, so it's hard for us to attract people. Mm -hmm. Russia still has 144 million people. But that's the thing is like Russia, like uh, obviously we exterminated. <clears throat> if I'm sure if we hadn't exterminated our indigenous population, we would have reached 100 million people by now probably. Yeah. But, you know, Russia didn't necessarily go through um, these types of things and had a longer time to, I mean, there were ma millions of dead. That's not true in every country, but like, um, it still had a longer time to build up to that population, so to speak, at least from a European <laughs> perspective. Whereas here we kind of started from scratch in so far as like we annihilated the first populations that were here. And then we started building up towards the hundred million. Anyway. Anyway, it, I think, I just think it's really interesting that we have this, this, what, I guess, notion mm -hmm. almost mm -hmm. that like Canada has been like always trying to get the strong immigration program, yeah. which obviously just isn't true, I guess. Yeah. And again, Absolutely. like I, you take a look at things like our population shift, like the growth or whatever. It's we're at like 1.1, I think. Like we do not have, we don't have booms. We don't, we're just fucking aligned. Yeah. Yeah. We've been very, <laughs> we've been relatively stagnant. Anyway. Canada so in a nutshell, relatively stagnant. <laughs> Yeah, we have the 37th largest population in the world. Okay. But we're the second largest country. Yeah. Um, so when we talk about Ukrainians specifically, we've kind of already talked a little bit about what they would represent through general immigration. But I do want to talk about specifics before we get into the story. Mm -hmm. And so Ukrainian immigration happened in four waves. The two major ones <clears throat> were the first one in the 1890s that we're going to be talking about now, and the ones that happened during the Soviet era, at the beginning of the Soviet era. Um, and sp so this largest one that happened, like if we want to estimate broadly, was from 1891 to 1914, to the start of the First World War, brought about 170,000 Ukrainians from the Russian Empire and Austria, um, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, Austria-Hungary, and specifically right. from regions like Galicia and Bukovina. Oh, hold on. Let me say that again. Bukovina. There we go. Bukovina. Thank God there aren't a lot of, I'm not going to be saying a lot of Ukrainian names during this episode because I'm sure I would butcher them. And what's interesting is, I think you were saying, well, why... Why did people come here? And I'm curious, like, why do you think the Ukrainians in particular would have been particularly um, prone to coming? I think a large part of it is, again, what Canada was asking for. Mm -hmm. So, like, yeah, asking for only farmers excluded a lot of people. But it also meant, like, the farmers themselves. Because farmers, again, you're a fucking farmer. You yep. do not have a great life. Sure. You might have, like, a nice, you might have an okay life. You might have one. But, like, a bad crop can kill you, bad this. Meanwhile, you look at the posters, and it's rolling fields of gold and yep. this beautiful natural landscape that's yours. And they're going to give you the land for free. You know, it's, mm -hmm. You'll, like, if you're a farmer, traditionally in Europe, you are beholden to somebody else. Yeah. Like a lot of these places, the monarchies are still just on the way out, more likely than not. Mm -hmm. So these Ukrainian farmers are like, okay, I can leave the monarch, still do what I'm doing. Like, I don't have to try and get a new trade or anything and go to this new place. Yeah. Why not? You're, you're, you're pretty close, yeah, <laughs> actually. Except obviously, as with every country or every population, there are slight differences where it comes to Ukraine. And we will be linking to some really interesting resources that I found in the description. But what's interesting is that, well, you know, yes the promise of better opportunities in Canada did um, incite a lot of people to come to Canada, of course. But we mustn't think that the Ukrainians weren't all poor, necessarily. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I think the story that we're going to be talking about kind of points to in a really interesting way is that, at least in the Stefanik story, he's careful to mention that these immigrants are well off to do are well off enough that they're not hungry. They have land, right? Mm -hmm. That is their own. And, you know, they are able to have many children. And they're actually just going to Canada because of the promise for a better future for their children. And I think you're right in saying that the monarchy and the uh, that element is also a very uh, a major element here because under the Russian Empire, of course, and that was one of the major factors for the Russian Revolution that would come not long after this, 
people were not living well, right? No. Then for like serfdom lasted a long time in, in the Russian Empire, longer than most. <laughs> like, and the the Russian economy was a backwater by European standards at the time. Oh, I'm sure. Right? Um, like people were not living particularly well. There was an, a kind of abolishment of serfdom, especially in Austria Hungary, less so in the Russian Empire. Mm. Um, but especially in uh, Austria Hungary, there was an abolishment of serfdom, which did help um, the conditions of a lot of the peasants that allowed them to have their own land and so on. But they still saw better opportunities in Canada. Right. right. So it is interesting to kind of think of that as like, yes, they were poor, but not all of them were dirt poor that were just uh, desperate, right? Um, right. I'm sure it's not, again, like we say desperate, but that's a very large and oversimplification. I think it's more just. Mm -hmm. There was opportunity for them to find, like, there's, freedom is an idea that can really mean a lot to a lot of people. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, sorry, I thought you were going to keep going. No, not right now. <laughs> Maybe later. Yeah. So, funny enough, um, the, there were two major places that, um, that encouraged Ukrainian immigration. So, Canada is one of them. And also, Brazil was another one. And also for relatively similar reasons, right? Um, there were a lot of there was quite an encouragement in Brazil and in Latin America to bring um, Eastern European immigrants, and you see mm -hmm. you see that in a very interesting novel, which I do want to talk about in a later episode called "The Blue Mountains of China," which was written by Rudy Weeb, um, which I know we talked about before because you saw me read it when we were together. Um, but you what see that we? happening where um, some. Russian immigrants go to Canada and Latin America as well. And you kind of follow this family as they go to these particular places, which active, actively encouraged um, mm -hmm. that type of, um, that type of immigration. And so um, like, like we were saying, so Canadian officials see, uh, sought out experienced farmers and most of them settled in the Prairie West. And so what you see happening um, is a kind of uh, a bunch of Ukrainian pockets in urban centers forming, right? Specifically in Northern Ontario, in the Rockies, um, and, you know, really entire villages are quite Ukrainian um, mm -hmm. in nature or quite Eastern European in nature. And they would kind of establish informal blocks that were marked by distinct agricultural lifestyles and folk traditions and architecture that you still see to this day if you go through the prairies. Um, yeah. I think that's kind of most of what I wanted to, yeah, the last thing I wanted to mention, so despite them being well off, right, um, yeah, and despite the end of serfdom, another thing that would encourage Ukrainian immigration specifically is that they weren't considered part of the same social standing as other Europeans, mm -hmm. right? And that's, I think, a major factor, right, uh, of any immigration is, are you considered a major part of society, right? We've seen it time and again throughout history. Are you socially ostracized, right? Mm -hmm. And often the people who are most ostracized will be the ones who will want to leave, right? or at least right. seek better lives, despite being perhaps well off. But if you're not part of the core group, that's devastating for a lot of people. And, and so that's one of the reasons why under, uh, in Austria-Hungary and under the, uh, the Russian Empire and later under the Soviet Union, many Ukrainians would leave. And um, yeah, a lot of them didn't have formal education. In 1916, there was a survey conducted uh, for, uh, uh, on Ukrainian populations that showed that 48% um, of the male and 70% of the female immigrants were illiterate, right? Mm -hmm. But again, this is a very kind of specific type of, uh, how could I say, statistic, right? Because that's not to say that they weren't smart or well-educated. They knew stuff. They just couldn't do this particular thing of reading, which is another way in which they ah, were kind reading. of put... No, but it's another way in which they were kind of pushed to the side, right? We see this all the time in the European colonial project of saying, well, they don't have reading and writing, so they must be inferior, mm -hmm. right? But that's not necessarily true. A lot of the pioneers were multilingual. Um, you know, they had a high level, of, uh, they had a vibrant culture, right? That had been steadily rising since the 19th century as having like some kind of solid background and footing, right? And so, and even there were eventually here in Canada, some reading societies, uh, what they called shitalnias here, 
that were actually um, that were actually put into place in order to benefit those who did not read, right? And mm-hmm. so there were these kind of small educational communities that were formed that would help the the immigrants, uh, the Ukrainian immigrants, you know, uh, integrate and maintain at the same time their cultural traditions. Right. And also there was a rich oral tradition that uh, you saw also appear in the Ukrainian <laughs> Canadian literature. <laughs> Anything else that we want to mention? About here? Ukraine? Yeah. I feel like it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. I don't know. They they were Big. they were they were given a dub they were given a bad hand. They still have a bad hand. Okay. So getting into the literature. Before I actually ask you what um, what you thought of the story, so Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian literature in Canada pretty much emerged quite quickly, right? Um, and as we'll see, the actual story that we're going to be talking about today was not written <clears throat> in Canada. It's about Canada, but it's not in Canada necessarily. Um, and the first uh, poem and or piece of literature that we can distinctly identify as Ukrainian in origin that was composed in Canada was published and dated to 1898. So actually quite quickly. Yeah, pretty quickly. And it's literally called Kanadiski Emigranti, which translates to Canadian immigrants. <laughs> it is the most straightforward uh, um, title possible. It was written by Ivan's Bura. Mm. And like it, it kind of foreshadows a lot of Ukrainian literature, right? In in that it talks about this kind of initial exodus uh, to the new world, and it compares life in the old country with that of the new, and finding the new one to be you know much better. And so you see that time and again in literature, and in this case, the Ukrainian um, Ukrainian version is a bit more specific, but not thematically necessarily different. Mm-hmm. Right? But also because of the advantages of technology, newspapers written in Cyrillic didn't take long to emerge. And politically charged works also started emerging at this time, right? And both of these factors will be very important uh, for later labor movements and political movements in Canada, as we've kind of been alluding to. So it's interesting to think that like the Ukrainians with these different ideas than your typical British immigrant, for example, would arrive just at this moment where print and ideas can be more democratically available and circulated. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of um, forces you to consider that, okay, well, how, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting why they would, uh, or how they would be important to later movements. (laughs) All right. So we've been talking for like 45 minutes. Let's get to the, let's get to the meat in this case, the actual meat and potatoes of it all, the actual literature. So as you were mentioning here, we're going to talk about Vasil Stefanik's uh, 1899 story, Kamini Crest. I hope I'm not butchering this. If anyone is listening to Vasil our episode Stefan. and speaks Ukrainian, please, please. tell me. Um, but it literally translates to the stone cross. I've seen other ones translated to a stone cross, but the, the imagery of stone cross is there regardless. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, have you ever heard of the story? I'm curious because it's kind of known. Not really. <laughs> okay. I've seen, so I've read, reading it, I know stories like it, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I have not read this one. Yeah. In researching it, and when I was looking up, because I knew I wanted to do an episode on Ukrainian Canadians and so on, and this particular story kept popping up as exemplifying uh, the experience of Ukrainian Canadians, and a a lot of literary scholars are mentioning how it was important, and I'm like, but I've, it's kind of been lost to time, it seems. Like, people don't really engage with this one anymore, but I think it's an interesting story. It's definitely an interesting story, but I can see why people wouldn't engage. It's very, so to give context for the story, to Mm -hmm. get, to jump right into it, Mm -hmm. you're following this old man named Ivan, who live, who's living in Ukraine at the moment, but is now leaving his property to go to Canada. Yes. Because he can no longer sort of afford, even though his land does well, yeah. his hill, his hump, as he calls it, it does well, it provides, but the conditions of Ukraine are such that he cannot afford to keep it. Yeah. So he hosts a big party in the night to sell all of his stuff, give it away, and then leave. Yep. And... Uh, specifically this story, I don't know if you, you, you looked at that, but this story is actually inspired by someone that the author knew. 
Mm -hmm. right um which i think adds a level of interest to the story because we tend to imagine oh you know it's a <clears throat> fantastical way of imagining or it's like a uh, an imagined way of uh seeing the immigration process but stefanik as an author would have known um right the or at least um a person who's similar to the main character who's as you were saying named ivan but the person who he's inspired by is named stefan right or steven stefan didur mm -hmm. who um is apparently it's pretty much almost exactly recorded from the story so basically we're reading according to the author himself stefan's departure right uh, oh, but stefan. he changed the name uh, Stefan would actually homestead in rural Alberta near the town, the modern day town of Chipman. Mm -hmm. And before leaving his native land, Didur actually erected a stone cross atop a hill on his property where it remains to this day, right? Uh, from what I've seen, I couldn't find any, any images of it online or anything like that, but what little information I could find about the background for this story mentions that there actually is a stone cross that was erected by Stefan, that's still mm -hmm. there. I don't know if that's true. I don't, um, because it's kind of hard to check up on this fact. I don't know how many people would actually look into this fact on like a small Ukrainian village if there's a stone cross, because I'm sure there's a million of them somewhere. Sure. So coming back to the story. Yes. What he's doing is he has a party. Well, not like a sort of party, but it's very like a somber get together for a lot mm -hmm. of people. Yeah. And he's sort of lamenting the fact that he has to leave. He was sort of dragged into it mostly by his sons. Yeah. And then there's his wife, who's the other big character, really, who, again, she, she's just the old woman, really, his wife. Yep. And he sort of disparages her, but then she has love to her. And it's just, it's not, it all sort of makes sense, but it's more just eight pages of somber occasions, not much happening. But And then he leaves in the morning, and he leaves with a pep in his step dancing a polka. Yes. <laughs> But you said like nothing much happens. I feel like the actions are not what's important of the story, so to no, speak. No, right? but I can also see why it's not something that would get brought up a lot due to the fact that it's very, it's very meandering for the period it talks about. Like I think there are a lot of interesting ideas for sure, but it's not something you would go to very easily. Right, and I feel also I, to to actually to your point. When you were when you, when I told you that you, you know Canada has a huge Ukrainian immigrant population, you kind of went, "Oh, yeah, really? I didn't know that." And I feel like part of the fact that Ukrainians have kind of integrated so seamlessly Canadian mainstream Canadian population, in a sense, makes it so liter their literature like this is kind of also forgotten mm -hmm. in a sense because we don't necessarily think of it as distinct. Right. Furthermore, the, the author never came to Canada. He was supposed to, and he never came to, to Canada. And he's actually much more recognized from what I've read in the Ukraine. Um, right. The Soviets actually tried to make him, like, uh, to give him honors as representative of Ukrainian literature, and he refused. Um, mm -hmm. But it goes to show just how much of a regard people have over there for his works, right? Um, yeah, actually, his son would also his son would immigrate the author's son would immigrate to canada and would actually be important in establishing quite a literary community here mm -hmm. um that's cool so one of the things that i want to talk about in this case and i think it's important because we're talking about literature so this work has been qualified as modernism right or as a modernist work yeah. um and people kind of I, i've seen um different types of uh, analyses of it where some people say it's expressionist modernism some people say it's naturalist modernism but before we get into that discussion do you want to tell people what modernism is in literature so modernism is not actually modern it refers more to mm -hmm. a period about 100 years or so ago right like around 1900 sure yeah 19 1920 or so mm -hmm. basically or the early 20th century type of thing before yeah, the early 20th world. century think heart of darkness yeah your quintessential modernist tale. Yep. And just like that recurring themes in modernism are things like industrialization, the crushing weight of civilization and society, uh, destitution of the common person, of the common worker, yep. the rise of communist movements and socialist movements, basically. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of that kind of philosophy going on at play, which this story kind of fits very nicely into. Okay. And why? 
And, and I'm, yeah, I'm curious because like you can see just to add actually before you answer that question, just to add when we, when people say expressionist or uh, naturalist, these are types of modernism. Yeah. Personally, I feel this fits more into expressionist modernism, which tends to focus more on the feelings that are ascribed to certain affairs, whereas naturalism tends to look at the world and its material conditions a bit more. Um, personally, I, when I was reading this, I felt more that Stefanik was going for emotional conveyance, but we can talk about that later. But uh, Right. So this fits neatly into modernism, mostly because Ivan fails, even though he did everything right. Mm. Yeah. And there's a very kind of... Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? What's the one? You've given up. It's futile. Mm -hmm. Everything is futile because yeah. Ivan, he worked his land. He was a good man. He was always polite. And then he did like all the right things. He had good, but still he failed. And now he has to go to the new world. Yeah. He has to sail off to the West, which is basically like in the context of the story, you die. You go to heaven, as it were. Right. Absolutely. But he can stop. Like, that's the thing is like, I, I, I didn't get the sense necessarily that he failed failed because his his farm is successful in a sense he's able to live off of it yeah but even he himself says he's being pushed out like he's successful but due to outside factors he then mm -hmm. cannot live yeah and i feel like part of those outside factors would be the the just general political conditions for example that he might yeah, be general political under. conditions i'm sure the taxes of serfdom all that fun stuff like yeah. and I, that's why to me it's more futile because he can live off the land but if he doesn't pay his taxes eventually somebody's going to come take the land from him anyway yeah and not just that like there's a really good point uh, there's a really good line this is early on in the uh let's see yeah where he says here he describes his relation to the nature itself in ukraine and um, on that hump women had once dug for sand which now mm -hmm. yawned into the sky in the form of gullies and caves like a horrible giant right um and yeah uh where was it exactly? Yeah, the sun was burning, actually not burning, but spitting fire. As I was clambering up the hill with the manure, the going was so rough, it almost peeled the skin off my knees. Sweat dripped from every single hair of mine, and my mouth felt so salty it was almost bitter. I barely managed to make it to the top. Up there, a breeze blew at me, but it was a faint breeze, really. Imagine, just a minute later, I felt as if knives were slashing my loins. I thought it would be the end of me. Mm -hmm. So even, uh, actually, I'll read the next line after because it's good. Thereafter, Ivan walked around stooped and people nicknamed him Double Up, Doubled Up Ivan. And so it's interesting where there are two things I want to mention. Do One, it. it's not just the outside factors. It's the land itself that's, <laughs> that's causing him, I guess, this sense of failure, mm -hmm. right? He has to deal with this hill that's not particularly good land, right? But it's what he has and he kind of has to deal with it. Whereas the hope at the very least is that by going to the prairies, they'll be dealing just with flat and good land. Which not wrong. <laughs> I mean, it's more it's more the facility, I guess, because he's <laughs> Sisyphus. <laughs> yes, yes, he is Sisyphus. He is just Sisyphus, the poor guy. And so, but unlike Sisyphus, he doesn't attain enlightenment by doing his one task over and over again. That's true. He attains enlightenment by breaking the cycle. <laughs> yeah, which I think is like the ultimate modernist move. Yeah, break the uh, cycle, break your chains. But well, not yeah, you can think of it that way. But like a metaphorical breaking as well, mm -hmm. right? Um, or a, a symbolic break is absolutely one that I think a lot we of modern. We were on sports. a break. No, but it's uh, I, I think I'm right in this case. I'm not super like modernism is not my most um, is not the the period I've studied most. But I think I'm right in saying that there's often that element of break. Or yeah, for sure. Oh no, no, for sure. That's the it. Depending on what kind of modernist tale you're looking at, modernism is usually pretty. It you it stories usually have some kind of break from like it, the the whole idea is it's trying to be a call to action to break from the current society. Mm -hmm. Exactly. In the heart of darkness, we have the the man who breaks off into the jungle to be like start his jungle society. Yes, exactly. Um, and what I find really interesting, especially with his, the fact that he became nicknamed, he, nick, he was nicknamed Doubled Up Ivan. And a bit later in that same page, he says, the older he became, the harder it was for him to descend the hill. There's kind of an interesting parallel here between him literally becoming 
hill-like, right? He's doubling over. He's associated with the hill. He can't hump. believe it necessarily, right? He's got that hump, that lovely lady hump. That's, yeah. That was the inspiration for the Black Eyed Peas song, actually. Yeah, they read this song. <laughs> they read this story. But it's also just things like the breast collar. Mm. And On he, the first page, you mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, Jordan. well, he, it's like, that. well, it's the weird story where he seems to be like pulling the wagon with his horse. Yeah. And it's, 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 it's a very weird, like visual image of where the horse is walking up the hill with the cart, but then Ivan's also walking up the hill with the cart and you have to imagine the two of them doing it together. Yeah. And like Sisyphus, you kind of have to imagine them happy or else there's just miserable people. Except who are... we know they're not happy. We know Ivan's miserable. Exactly. Exactly. He gets a um, thistle in his foot every time. Yep. Exactly. Um, as there's a, I, I have to admire Stefanik's writing or at least the translation here. It's really good. I really like the way that um, he turns a phrase, right? In the second mm -hmm. paragraph in the first section, as the horse plodded up the hill as if it were treading across ice, a vein on Ivan's forehead swelled so enormously, it seemed someone had hit him over the head with a stick. From above, it looked as if Ivan had strung the horse by his neck strap for some great offense, while Ivan's left hand was engirded by a net of blue veins resembling a chain of blue steel. You're a blue chain network. But the, the imagery here, I think, is provocative or is insightful in, in what you're saying, right? He's chained to the land. He can't do anything else. If he tries to do anything else, it's literally death. Well, I think that's an important part of the story. And so yeah. far that that's why he has to rely on people like his sons to bring him out. Mm -hmm. And again, why? Because originally he doesn't want to go. The man right. has to be basically kicked and dragged because he's like, I'm an old man at this point. I don't want to go to a fucking new land. I don't want to be mm -hmm. pulled along. I'm so done with this shit. I hate this. But then by the end, he's dancing a polka. <laughs> he's drunk he's dancing and he's having a great time all he exactly uses. and he pulls it's the only way you'll convince old people to do anything is just get them drunk get them them liquored them. up <laughs> anyway so yeah it's like what's the, what's the anyway so he's and so i think that's a big part of it when he's finally free he can finally take a look at back and be like oh i'm finally free that's great mm -hmm. but to start it's hard to it's hard to take that rational look and be like oh no i don't want to leave because as much as humanity as a species loves freedom we also love familiarity yes exactly and personally i feel like that's where or at least that's part of the reason why <clears throat> stone or the stone cross is the 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 title and at least a symbol one of the major symbols of the story even mm -hmm. though it kind of doesn't really play that much it's a background symbol in a sense but i feel like what you're pointing to of both the stability and um and kind of desire for freedom plays in right mm -hmm. is this imagery of stone right um where ivan has or gains Marvin, our boy. Yeah, where he, he gains this kind of sense of purpose by you know breaking stones or moving them and being able to cultivate the land. But at the same time, the stone, you know, is this thing that lasts millions of years. It's been around on Earth, it's been the Earth, right, forever. And it will continue long after um Ivan dies and we all die. But Specifically, the stone cross, I feel, is an important image, right? This the the religious element of it, I think, is 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 integral in this case, right? Of allowing Ivan to imagine a better world, right? As you were saying, heaven, right? It's this it's this otherworldly thing that he's working towards as his kind of freedom, right? But also this thing that provides so much stability in his life that doesn't want him necessarily or, or that makes him not want to move mm -hmm. i don't know if any of that made sense no i get it mm. like there's a certain kindness mm -hmm. to this you know yeah there's a certain kind of kindness to the fact of or not kindness but there's a certain nice feeling that you get yeah. when you know things are stable you don't have to worry yeah absolutely <laughs> and I think that, you know, we've talked about religion before, but that's kind of like the power of it, right? It's the stable force that allows you to imagine something greater than yourself, mm -hmm. right? Or allows you to move towards something greater, something, some kind of imagined future. Something there that wasn't there before. Right. <laughs> right. And uh, to, to, to finish off on this religious element, I, I do find it interesting. You, they mentioned it at the beginning. Um, yeah, uh, or uh, was it at the beginning where they mention his, him going to Easter or him going to church, right? Do you Take remember that part? Take me to church! 
no. Okay, sorry, it's on the second page. Um, towards the end of the second page where he says, in the village, Ivan was also known for attending church only once a year at Easter and for yeah. training his chickens. Um, but that, that Yo, little... Chicken training, let's go. <laughs> but I find it interesting as well of like, despite him wanting to achieve some greater purpose, either through work or religion and so on, that the fact that he has to work so much is what's stopping him from achieving some kind of greater purpose. And it kind of forces him to only go and attend church once a year. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Stefanik has him go to church during Easter because what happens at Easter, it's the resurrection of Christ, right? It's um, this rebirth that you feel, or at least this starting anew, right? The sins of people are mm -hmm. washed away after Christ was crucified. And so you get to start again fresh. And so I feel like it's interesting where the one year he chooses, or the one day a year he chooses to go to church is the one in which it off is the, the day that promises the most in terms of change right? And the possibility for change and breaking out of this vicious cycle that he's in. Um, and I just wanted to mention that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have anything to add about that, but I thought that was a really interesting line in this case. <laughs> uh, um, no, I like it. All right. Cool. All right, all right. Okay, then. Cool, cool, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Last symbol I wanted to mention was leaves that I noticed. Leaves! <laughs> Which sounds, and then we'll get into like a bit more of a general discussion, but I, I feel like it's a cool symbol for movement, uh, or at least again, trying to, to change your, your, um, your, your state, your standing, so, so to speak in the world, but also of death in a sense. And on page five, there's a really interesting line where he says, now we'll be knocking around the world and drifting like leaves across a field in our old age. Well, so leaves are always important because leaves become part of the soil yeah. that then makes a better dirt for the next generation. Yes, exactly. And Ivan is obviously knowledgeable and wise beyond his years. His <laughs> kids want this whole thing going to Canada and all that, but he seems to understand it's not going to be that different from what they have now. Yeah. Exactly. He's a bit jaded. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like, he's, he's a bit cynical about that whole Canada thing, which fair enough. Um, <clears throat> and we, like the, the line immediately after where he says, God knows how we'll fare. So I'd like to ask your forgiveness before these are people. Well, so this, this is more, we need more context because his yeah. whole, this whole speech is him talking to his wife almost because he's been angry at her for this. He's been angry at all this. And then he's now, he's very sweet on her. It's, it's a very strange relationship portrayed in the short story. Yeah. How would you define that relationship? Like what's the importance of it? I think because the importance of what's going on is that it's all stuff. It's all new stuff. They're being thrown into turbulent waters. Yeah. And the only familiar thing they have is each other. Mm -hmm. The only thing. So the but only that's changing. Yeah. That's changing. But in so far that no matter how crazy things get, they can't abandon each other. Now yeah. they have to keep going because they are what they have. Exactly. All we have is love. All you need is love. Mm -hmm. Bum, and bum, I, I think love I think is all you need. I think the uh, the the association with leaves still holds in that sense. Oh, a hundred percent. Right. Not only because leaves are associated with trees, right, and the rest of the earth, they, they live together, right. And as soon as you know they they they're tied to this community. If you want to imagine like a series of leaves as a kind of interconnected community of uh, on a tree or something like that, mm -hmm. but even as the tree dies or this community dies, so to speak, these leaves will continue to live or at least continue to have some kind of purpose going around. And as you were saying, providing for the earth, right? Or providing for something new or maybe creating new communities, right? Um, so their, their relationship while turbulent will always remain. And I think that's very, very uh, astute. I, I like that analysis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the leaves actually kind of come up again later in page seven, where when they're singing during the party and all that, um, as Ivan is getting drunk. Go oh, Ivan. This is towards the end of the story. If people want to read it, it's like nine pages long. It's nothing. It's very, very short. The lyrics drifted along like yellow autumn leaves chased by the wind across the frost-hardened ground, now and then settling in every gully and quivering with the frayed edges as if before death. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I thought this. There, there's kind of like a few things that... Um, 
yeah, I don't know what to make of this line uh, of this specific sentence exactly, but it it just struck me as continuing in what we were talking about, this idea that, you know, there is some kind of symbolic death that's happening, right, in one area. Oh, yeah, but yeah. it's the yeah. death of his old life. Exactly. But you know, something like the lyrics and so this cultural element is still going to keep going and at least allows for some form of life to continue or some form of continuation, even in a new world to exist, right? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, this ties back to the religious symbolism that exists throughout. Mm. I don't know. Is there anything else you wanted to add about like the symbolic elements or anything like that? Because I have other questions, but I don't know if there was anything else in particular that you wanted to add before I asked them. About this story? Yeah. Um, I think it's rather interesting that his sons, who are the main impetus to bring him to Canada, aren't really mentioned or show up. What do I you think, think that changes? I think it really gives a good job of showing off Ivan's perspective, first of all. Like, this is, like, how, how strange this is. Mm -hmm. And it really puts the story in his favor. Because you okay. almost look at the sons being like, what the fuck are you guys doing? Why the <laughs> fuck do you keep taking, like, what are you trying to do to your dad right now? <laughs> and more to the point, Ivan is more who Canada wants, not the sons. The sons are said to be learned people. Like, they are people who are... Ivan is the farmer. Mm hmm Exactly. Which is kind of sad, in a sense. Because I feel like by bringing... By going to Canada, they're thinking that it'll be different. But I think to, you kind of alluded to this. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, they'll be turned into Ivan, right? They're the ones that are going to... They're learned now, but that's not mm -hmm. what Canada wants. They want farmers they and want so, ivan exactly but ivan is too old and so they'll mold i think kind of what you're pointing to is the fact that they'll mold the sons into ivan right um but hopefully it sh despite that it shouldn't be as hard as in the mm -hmm. ukraine there is still that underlying hope that it's not as hard right but i don't think stefanik ever kind of answers that question as to whether that's true or not right and i think that's a good thing Right. He, I think that's part of what makes this interesting to analyze from a Canadian point of view is that the idea of what Canada represents, sorry, what the idea of what Canada represents is more important than what it actually is. I don't know if right. you agree with me on that, but uh, about what Canada represents. Yeah. It's like it's, it's, it's always just an image. It's always just a symbol. It's never actually explicitly said they, you never see them go to Canada. They just enter on the, the train and that's it. Right. Um, What's and the symbol of that, but it's, it's just like the idea that Canada's is never specific. Like uh, Stefanik, the author never actually tells you, whether their image or their vision of Canada is realized or true. Mm -hmm. He he leaves it open-ended, and I think that's a good choice as an author of saying, like, it's I can't answer that. <laughs> well, I think, again, if we go back to the idea of Sisyphus, it's mm -hmm. that would mean that they're in some kind of level of hell. So if they're making some active choice to leave, that would usually be a good thing. Right. That's my own personal interpretation. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Do you have anything to back that up with? Uh, mostly just the, the illusions in the story, the, the futility of the story. A lot of the themes sort of point to the fact that, like, if nothing else, they're probably in purgatory. Mm, interesting. I'm not saying it's a literal, like, they are in hell in this story. No, I'm saying, like, they're in their own type of hell, mm. and they're making an act of choice to exit and leave. They are right. taking a decision, which I think is just usually a good thing in stories. Again, mm -hmm. that's a good, it's usually, for modernism, it's usually can end up being some kind of, even if they fail and die, they'll be happier. Yeah. Absolutely. Which Ivan himself seems to realize. I don't know. Like, they are in hell, but I don't know if they're in, maybe they're in purgatory during the party, I would say, maybe. Like, they're not constantly in purgatory, I though. I think they are. Why? Because I would say, because you see it at the beginning that they're, you, you see the difficulty. So they're in that metaphorical hell, so to speak. And it's only in that moment of bliss, at least from Ivan's perspective, that he enters, or at least he transitions from not accepting the immigration to accepting it and going away. So it's during the party that they're kind of in this metaphorical purgatory, you know? Wait, so you're saying that they're in hell, then they're in purgatory, then they're in heaven? Or at least they're going towards heaven, right? <laughs> okay, so they go through all three... At least, if, if you want to continue on that metaphor, I, I, I'm, I didn't think about it that way, but I'm just grabbing onto your idea. Well, no, I meant it. like they were in like purgatory throughout the whole story, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then going to heaven, or they were in hell the whole story. I don't think they switched all the way through through, through three different ones. Okay, you're wrong, but okay. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> that's probably right. You're probably right. No, no, I don't know, but I, because I, I didn't think about it. So you're, you're right. I was just playing off of your idea and trying <laughs> to take it to its 
kind of logical it's, extreme, but yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's important, I think, that to recognize that like, yes, they're farmers, yes, their land is good, but it doesn't mean they're living a good life. Right. Even the best farmer is not going to be living a truly well-off life. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot for him to be gained right. by, again, becoming the master of his own destiny, by finding some kind of freedom. Right. And I think that story is, in, in the end, pointing to the fact that this will be a positive change, but it is not going to be an easy one. Mm -hmm. And if not, not maybe not positive in material sense, but positive for his soul. Right. Okay. And that's be why positive for his feeling, you know? Yeah. And that's why I think it feels more, it fits more into the expressionist category than yep. the naturalist one. Right. Because yes, the material aspects of it is are present, but that's not the focus here. Mm -hmm. They're like the, they're, they're the impetus behind the feeling of uh, loss or, or whatever of wanting more. Yeah. Um, do you feel like this story reading it fits in with what we were talking about, the history of Ukrainian immigration to Canada, right? Or do you feel like there's a disconnect between how I was describing, and of course, in a very surface level at some point, but do you feel like it's, it aptly represents the Ukrainian um, move towards Canada or what we were talking about it? I think this is a positive or? No, I'm, I'm asking, like, do you feel like it's, it, it, it kind of accurately or interestingly demonstrates this immigration towards Canada. I'm not going to say accurately because I don't know that anybody. I don't yeah, that's know why I changed it. So like to interestingly, because I. <laughs> I think it is an interesting portrayal. I think it takes a much more nuanced look at immigration, where which is often thrown into this dichotomy of either wholly evil or wholly perfect. Mm -hmm. When the reality is it's, I guess, somebody who's, who's had to change countries, not as an immigrant, more as an expat. But as somebody who's had to change countries multiple times, it's a very different kind of feeling. Yeah. Interesting. You know, there's, there's a very, it, there's, there's a lot of good and a lot of bad. There's a lot of trouble and a lot of uh, upheaval, but a lot of like opportunities and mind bending experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like it's interesting that Stefanik chose to write about this because he himself was not an immigrant, mm -hmm. right? He saw everyone else. And like you were mentioning, he inspired himself directly off of a friend who, who moved to Canada and he was supposed to. I think mm -hmm. Stefanik was actually supposed to move to Canada and it never happened. Um, but it's, I feel like that adds a level of engagement with the story or the subject matter rather that you don't see with someone, with other writers, for example, that we've looked at on the show who are immigrants and who naturally add the sense of wonder to the story, right? That they're writing. Um, we talked at length about the emigrant uh, many, many, many episodes ago, right? Where it's all like, Canada is great and it's beautiful forests and everyone is happy and yay. But yay. in this, he, with the distance that he has, where all he can where all he knows of Canada is like the limit of his imagination, there is that sense of like hesitation, if you will, mm -hmm. um, that I think really adds and makes the story different than other immigration literature that we've read to Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there was just one last uh, point that I wanted to mention here um, that kind of points to what you were saying about this uh, or what we've been alluding to about this ambiguity that people have um, about the move and specifically that it's one of necessity rather than one of desire. Mm -hmm. It's on page five, right? Um, yeah. At the end of, uh, at the beginning of page five, just before part four, right? right. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah. Uh, so it's again, during this discussion that he has with his wife of like apologizing and so on. Um, only skin and bones. Is this my friend supposed to wander away from the bed on the stove? She Sorry. was a she was a good mistress of my household. Worked hard, didn't waste her time, and in her and in her old age, she takes to the road. There, do you see where your road and your Canada leave to? Over there, he pointed to a grave through the window. And yeah, like it's interesting where it's to be at least this moment in the story where he starts to shift towards thinking that it'll actually bring death towards more of a symbolic communitarian death, right? And yeah, I feel like that quote kind of summarizes a lot of what we were saying today. Yep. Anything else you wanted to mention before we call it a day? Um, read the story for yourself. I think there's, I think there's, a, there's definitely a lot more we could be saying involving things like the drinking. The... We can talk about that if you want, sure. I mean, just... 
the the way it's a very cultural almost sentiment because you're mm. he's drinking as if he's almost taking his last drink yeah yeah and again lots of symbols almost of death of mourning of going out to die mm -hmm. but then at the end he's dancing like the like a spirit in a graveyard yeah they're celebrating a death mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not a funeral in a sense well it's a different kind of funeral it's a different kind of funeral mm. it's a different kind of living and dying so just to 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 cap off here the Ukrainians, as we were mentioning, did have quite a bit of a legacy um, in Canada. We will be come returning to them either directly or indirectly uh, mm -hmm. as are coming uh, throughout coming episodes. Um, you know, they would be persecuted in Canada as they became associated with those whom Canada was at war during the mm -hmm. world wars, for example. And obviously even post world wars as the cold war became a thing, they would particularly be perceived um, as Soviet agents, for example. Um, Soviet was, agents. And Ukrainian Canadian, despite this, the Ukrainian Canadian identity remains strong and has really infiltrated mainstream culture, right? Um, you see onion dome churches when you go into the prairies or uh, painters, um, and you, you see all kinds of sculptures throughout the Canada. Food. Just food. like within the within within Canada, there's a there's a strong sort of Eastern European Canadian Canadian food culture. Yep, absolutely. Most of the influence is like non linguistic. I, uh, from what I've understood, there are at least uh, yes, there are pockets of you know like anywhere there are pockets of communities, but mostly the <laughs> language language is, language is always going to be hard to bring into Canada. Yeah, exactly. So it. it most of the influence is cultural or at least on a surface level or at least a material level. Mm -hmm. And as you were saying, like mu musical influence on folk, on folk traditions is definitely perceived. And food. Yep. And food. Yep. Oh, now you're making me hungry. Good. That's the point. <laughs> right. And actually funny enough, I do want to mention this because mm -hmm. it was the subject of one of our recent episodes on education rights in Canada. Right. Um, after 1897, a lot of Ukrainians in Manitoba would actually take advantage of opportunities for bilingual instruction. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was one of the ways that for a while Ukrainian communities perpetuated their traditions was the kind of right to teach both in English and Ukrainian, right? And so there were specifically Ukrainian teachers that um, were allowed to continue to operate. Uh, and there were bilingual schools that operated unofficially in Saskatchewan, mm -hmm. right, for example. But over time, a lot of these would become legislated away. Um, so until in 1918, you could no longer do that in Saskatchewan. In Man Manitoba, we talked about this as well, where there were a lot of English-centered or Anglo-centered school rights that were put into place. Yep. Now there's mostly, if they exist, they're very private institutions. Exactly. That's exactly it. And a lot of the criticism of certain of these schools like this were because it, quote unquote, s retarded the assimilation of Ukrainian children, right? Um, which is crap. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Shall we end it there? We've been talking for like an hour and a half at this point. Yeah, we can end it there. That feels right. like a good spot as any. All right. Just remember, folks, treat Ukrainians well. Treat everyone well. Yeah. Except Nazis. They don't. They, they're not that <laughs> <laughs> You could say that about a couple of groups. We'll leave it there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. So obviously, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, just reach out to us. We're 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 on stuff. We're happy to listen. Yeah. Send us an email, Facebook, whatever. If you want to support the show, we mentioned it at the start. Uh, at the start, you can do through you can do so through PayPal donations, or you can Woo. join our Patreon for Woo. extra ad free episodes. Yeah, and baby. You know, as always, leave us a review, share the great news of this podcast to your friends. And mm -hmm. I think that I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's about it. We'll just we'll just peter out anyway. Anyway, <laughs> good talking to you folks. So we'll see you all next time on another episode of Historia Canadiana. Bye everyone. Bye.